right. Boom. Danny is back. back. What a ride. Yeah. You know, the champagne and, and the girlfriends that you'd never, ever the have at, at school. There's, there's only a few things on this planet that can replicate those emotions. Um, most not legal. My enthusiasm outweighed my talent, as Stoner once famously <laughs> yeah. said to Valentina. <laughs> and I got injured quite a bit doing that. And why do we keep going back, even though it smashes us in the face? Because we're addicts. I landed on the curb, and it, and it, and it spiral fractured my femur. And I landed on the curb, my, 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 leg, oh. my leg was under my head. He was officially 16, right? Yeah. Went up to Scotland for his birthday. He's got all these 18 balloons all oh, over the place. No. <laughs> <laughs> You'd rather have two world championships or some friends. I can make friends after I've won the world championships. And I'm the youngest ever world champion because of that. 23. Yeah. But, but like, I, I wouldn't have been a 23-year-old world champion if I went in World Superbikes at 22 because he took my job in GP. I know, I saw got. that. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah thanks yeah. for reminding me. Yeah, sorry. I remember the crunch, 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 crunch. Boom, right. boom. Danny it's Bucket. Back. What a ride this is. Hello and welcome to Pushing the Limit podcast with me, Danny Bucken. We are here, episode nine. Got a little bit of a confession. Today's guest, I might have fangirled a little bit when I was a bit younger. Um, he's done some winning. It's fair to say you've done some winning. James Tozen, welcome. Welcome Thank to you. London, first of all, and welcome to the podcast. Cheers, Danny. Pleasure to be here, mate. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. I, I was actually a bit of a fangirl growing up, watching you. Uh... Uh, you'd have been a young lad <laughs> when I was rising around. In fact, you were a young lad, because I, I, I looked a bit of on your stats, and in 2007, when you were doing Super Teens, I was doing the double at Brands. So, and you, what, what would you have been there, about 16 or so? I actually think 2007 would have been my first year in Super Teens, yeah. and... I was 13 and I was a little bit more rotund than I am now as well. I don't know how. <laughs> I was a little bit chubbier, but yeah, that was my... Um, but you were winning though. Yeah, I was. I could yeah. win the wet races, right? but on the dry races, I just suffered, yeah. Really? But we right. was like... Motocross. Yeah, yeah. we was you literally... Like, you like it slick. Yeah, we was literally motocross, took a Aprilia 125 to a go-kart track, and then literally dad was like, right, you're racing next weekend, and that was it. What was the Quacker 400 thing like to ride? Was that fun? Mega. Do you know what? They were good because it was like, before I got into the 600, it was such a, a middle class bike from Aprilia. I still think to this day, if they had the 400s, how they were, obviously like a newer version, they'd be so great because they would get, they give such a um, a foot in, like a foot in the door if you like for the 600 because you only had a little bit more power at the 600. Yeah, similar style. Yeah. So, but anyway, yeah, you and your career. Mm. I've got the first question before we talk about the career. When you sit and look back at your career, like today, I sat here now, are you satisfied? Do you think, do you know what? No. No. I, I, I thought this. I don't think anybody's. I, I was going to say that. If you're that competitive, you're never satisfied with anything. Uh, it's a curse. It's a disease that we have as, as competitors uh, and competitive people. And like Valentino Rossi, like people like that, I, I know we'll be absolutely gutted in him win that tenth championship. Yeah, just because it's just our nature. As soon as you become complacent with stuff, um, you know you start losing stuff, don't you? So and if you won ten, you'd sit and go, "I wish I won 11. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I thought that for sure. Because for sure, yeah. Obviously, I tried to put myself in that perspective, and I was like, I wouldn't be happy with my career, but I haven't done enough winning. No. But even if you won two, three, four, five championships, I think that's the competitiveness that we have in us is different, isn't it? And yeah. I think you'd just be like, nope. I have the memories though, and they are they are super special, you know, to 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 stand on a podium and you've you've had it yourself where you're listening to your national anthem that you've you've achieved something of of that level that you're you're you know you're you're being acknowledged by your own country with that anthem and and the champagne and all the rest of it it's a very very special emotion and uh, there's 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 only a few things on this planet that can replicate those emotions um most not legal and uh, <laughs> motorcycle racing is luckily and uh, and I was lucky to kind of experience that but um you know it's not easy it's not easy when you haven't got it in your life that's for sure because uh, um you, you don't realise when everything's going good, uh, it's not a natural state to be in. When you're winning championships, when you're winning races, and on Sunday night with all the team and the celebrations and other, it's just a, an absolute ball, isn't it? That life is just amazing. When you're winning motorcycle racing, razzing around at 200 miles an hour, you know, the champagne and, and the girlfriends that you'd never, ever gave. You'd never have at school, at school unless unless you were razzing around and being successful. Um, so everything that comes with it, it's uh, it's a fabulous life, a fabulous existence, uh, and unfortunately, we get old and we get slow. That I tell you what, though, like that you're feeling, you want to be able to bottle that feeling up. Like when you win, I haven't won a world championship race, but like to hear that national anthem, to hear that like the proudness that you have, serve, like serving your country as such, you know that that you wish you could bottle that up. And obviously, when you was 
in your heyday, the, the fans, there was, there was a lot of fans there, weren't there? And that just, yeah, that feeling, that's something. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was lucky because I rode in, a, in an era where I was the only British rider for a couple of years against some of the greatest, you know, with Bayliss, Biaggi, Haga, Corsa, <laughs> uh, Zaus, Hodgson. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't compete with uh, Hodgson and Zaus in that 07 year. They weren't too much GP, but still. I, and it, I, it, was, it was me against Australia, Japan, um, uh, what, what other nationalities? I'm thinking of Spain, Italy, obviously would be Aji. And and I was, you know, the patriotic support that you got at racetracks, uh, because I was a Brands actually, it was 126,000. Um, and it, you can't, I mean, you've raced at Brands yourself when it's really busy, because BSB is always busy, isn't it? You yeah. know, you, and when all that embankment is completely packed, and it was the ear of the like their air horns. And when when I came into Clearways, the last corner, and, and you can't hear you, what gear you're in because of the air horns. Screams. It's just um, it is something. And it's really weird because you're probably like when even talking about it now, it kind of takes you back. You can probably like it's like yeah, special. if you close your eyes, you'd be there again. It's special. Incredible. I mean, it's just normal when you're doing it, so you don't realise just how special it is until you finish. And and then you watch a little bit back sometimes when it comes on, like you know the clips on on TV and stuff. Uh, and you're thinking, crikey, for for everything to come together on that weekend, and we were just talking about it before, the, the track knowledge and the travel experience, jet lag or um, the different nationalities and different foods and everything that you've got to get used to at world championship level compared to national racing. It's unbelievable how much experience that you need to get to be fast enough for every single racetrack to win championships because you can go and do like a world championship and every time you go to Donington Park, you can get into the top six, possibly a podium, like the wild cards did back in the yeah. day with like Walker, Chris Walker and Neil Hodgson. Um, but to go to a world championship and learn every single track as good as Donington when you're growing up, like at Jerez, Mugello, um, you know, whatever it is in Magnicor or Laguna Seca, to learn those tracks as good as like your Donningtons and your Brands Arches, Silverstones, everywhere where you grew up. Yeah, an American in America, a Japanese yeah. in Japan, like yeah, every yeah. single nationality is strong at their own tracks, aren't they? It's amazing. It, it's amazing how difficult it is because you don't realise what experience and practice you're getting when you're growing up as a kid on those tracks when you're growing up on them in, in Super Teens and yeah. 400s and CB500 Cup like I did or the Super Stock like, like you did and... Um, you know, when it comes to then, you're at the side of Troy Bayliss or Valentino Rocky, Rossi on, on the on the grid. All of that, yeah, all of that gives you a chance. We're going to come to the MotoGP days, but did you ever have that where you looked around and thought, oh, my, or was you just competitive, don't care, or did you have that where you looked around like, shit, that's yeah. Rossi, shit, like that's Stoner. Like, did you ever have that where you was like, yeah, um, not 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 so much. I think I think internally a little bit some, just, somewhere. Yeah, I'm here to race. I deserve yeah. the place. That's yeah. Yeah, and and I was I was overly competitive to where I wasn't there to make friends, and I didn't make many when I was racing. I was uh, I was I was accused of being a bit aggressive here and there, but never dangerous. But a nice bit people aggressive. finish last. Yeah, there you go. There you That's go. That's my problem. There you go. <laughs> That's my problem. I'm gonna start being a dickhead. <laughs> we'll give you some tips off air though. I don't want to share them. Um, but yeah, so your so your life then. So growing up, did you fall into racing? Was you privileged kid? Did you no. you like like tell me yeah? How uh, did you born get in into Do it? born in Doncaster. Mum and dad split up when I was three. We lived in a caravan, and uh, we uh, we then kind of moved in with the grandparents. Um, and uh, then my mum met a new boyfriend who had a motorcycle, and I was about eight then, and, and I didn't even know what a motorcycle was. Then I was playing the piano quite seriously. I was at grade six, and I wanted to go to London College of Music, and it was all set out. And and then this guy came into my mum's life and our life and bought me a motorcycle, Charles Wright, um, T Y T Charles bike, and I'd started trials riding with him. He, he, he never raced himself, but he, he, he knew how to ride. He had a road bike. Um, and then that was it. Loved trials riding. Went to motocross for a couple of years, but I was I was a bit short back then. The motocross bikes were really tall, and I was um, uh, my, my what was it? My 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 enthusiasm outweighed my talent, as Stoner once famously <laughs> yeah. said to Valentina. <laughs> and I got injured quite a bit doing that. And then I realised with the road racing, you didn't need the height. So um, I started junior road racing in 1995 with Steve Brogan. James Ellison oh, wow. yeah. and um, a, a couple of bunch of guys that obviously did very, very well. Uh, and that was it. Um, I won that championship in my first year. Um, and then Super Teams like, you said, like yourself. 
and then CB500s, and then onto the... Um, uh, when I did CB500 in 97, I, I just did really, really well compared to all the guys, and Honda then put me on a 600 at 16 years old. They actually changed the rules from 18 to 16 for me to be able to race. I had to race a number zero because I couldn't score any points because that, that was the deal. I don't know why that was the deal, but... Maybe you was too fast. Well, didn't I, want to embarrass everyone. I, I, it was a, a bit of a taboo thing, like with the insurances and everything, because at that point you did have to be 18 to ride a 600. So, so. they're trying to say that you're not competitive because you're not scoring points type thing, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, don't know how, I don't know how risky it was, to be honest. But it was it was a great chat. I mean, we've got Jim Moody, Mara Brown, Steve Plater. Um, um, it, it just like, you know, really Stats. good quality. Yeah. John Crawford. Um um, Simpson, I think did a uh, Ian Simpson did a few as well that year. I think he was on Superbike as well. But just um, you know, and I was running around with them straight away and and, and picking up a few wins and trophies. And, and then that that was it. That one year in '97, Castrol Honda just started a brand new uh, Supersport team because it was the very first year of World Supersport has been a World Championship in 1998. Some people say it's '97 officially, but '98. Uh, and I was Colin Edwards and Aaron Slight's teammate with Mikel Paquet, who unfortunately lost his life in round two of that particular year. So I lost my teammate, which was really tough. And that was my first um, inroad to World Championship racing at 17 years old. That's mad. And so you were teammates with Colin Edwards then as well? Yep. And this, did, or did, when you become his teammate later on in, in life, yep. did you, you talk about that? Yeah. Because yeah. I bet you looked up to him then. You was like, wow. Cause, oh, big mate, time. Coming from the CB500, straight handbars, yep. like the motocross rentfuls, eh? Yeah, 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 literally like a and courier bike. And literally chucked onto, yeah. <laughs> chucked onto a race bike where you are tucked in. Yeah. And... Yeah, going from a London courier bike to where's the competitiveness come from? Because obviously that has to come from somewhere. Just like, natural, just that natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was horrible as a kid. Like you know, even if I lost an arm wrestle to my brother, it was you know there was there was toy, the, yeah, the TV was you know there's a remote, remote going through the TV <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, so just yeah, I think I think there's just something in us that we're just angry people unless unless we channel it. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I tell you what, motorcycle racing there is no better channel. If yeah. if you've got all of these like autism or Burgess thing, I, I do, all these syndromes that we've kind of like discovered, like over the last kind of 15, 20 years. Um, if if kids have got any problems whatsoever, buy them a motocross bike or a motorcycle. Let them rise around a bike, a, a track for a couple of hours, and honestly, you might get a pretty balanced kid by the evening. Hundred percent. I am that person. You know, I tick every box. I am not actually diagnosed with ADHD, but I tick every box. And I even said that to my dad, like, why didn't you get me diagnosed when you were younger? And he was like, mate. Like you race bikes, you loved it. You was energetic. You just was really, you're just an energetic person. You know, you talk a lot. Like that's just who you are. The medication or bikes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he bought you bikes. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It was like, I kind of just felt like he was like, mate, like you, you'll be all right type thing, you know? But that, like you say, like going motorbike racing, it's really funny because as you get older, when you're younger, you don't see it. You just talk to everyone. You are you see yourself as a motorbike racer. It's fine. But then when you finally get older and you start to meet people, like I met my wife and I told her what I did and she didn't understand it. And then when she come to my first race meeting, I like smashed myself to pieces and I was not all right. But everyone's like, you all right? You're like, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm out in the next race. They don't get it, do they? Like it's such a... Um, it's such a different way of life. But when you grow up in the paddock, it's the normal way of life, isn't it? Like... The sponsors, the like you're saying, the parties after the wins, like that's in that situation, that is what you do, isn't it? That's just yeah. normal. There's only a small percentage of people that want to risk their life to achieve what they want to achieve in life. Yeah. And that's the intensity of motorcycle racing, and that's why it's so popular. And why do we keep going back, even though it smashes us in the face? Because we're addicts. Exactly. And yeah. it's like, I, I, how many times did you retire in your career where he's like, done, I'm not doing it anymore? Right, looking at live time in 10 minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, just one for me and that, but that was it. I did the risk. But um, before that, honestly, never. Never. You now, just like, this is what I'm doing and that was it. Yeah, even at the side of the bed with the, I broke my femur oh. really badly and the leg was oh, all over the place. And, and, and even at the side of the bed. You in, just pointed to your shoulder with your leg. Cadwell. Oh. I had a really bad crash at Cadwell in uh, just testing. What, the what turn? Uh, Charlie's turn two. Oh, that, that Land, gets you, that curve. does. That's yeah. a... Land on the curb and it, and it and it spiral fractured my femur and I landed on the curb. My my leg oh. my leg was under my head. Like so, Cameo, he had the same, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, mountain. mountain. Oh yeah. my god! But mine was the femur, so it was oh, a, it was the full leg worse. rather than just the bottom of the. And leg. that actually can kill you, can't it? Because yeah, if you the... sever sever the artery, yeah, yeah. But it took forty five minutes for the air ambulance to go. There was just me and a marshal on the grass, like you know. Luckily, you, it was, was you screaming or was you, right? was you No, it was that geezer? bad. 
you know when you, yeah. you, you when when your body's in a certain position that it's never been before because you know, I don't do yoga and stuff. Um, and my legs never been around there, even on even on some parties, it's never been around there. <laughs> <laughs> Unless so, someone's got a picture they can send us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. people not be able to remember no, anyway. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah. like when when yeah. when something's so like unusual and and fright like not frightening but like um, y- your body just shuts down to to kind of go into survival mode and. Yeah, and, and it did, and luckily, um, but yeah, oh my god, the problem, the biggest problem was when the helicopter landed, because I was like that with the legs, oh. they couldn't get me in the back of the helicopter. Oh, your legs sticking out the window. So they had to straighten the leg. Oh no, to get, way. To get me in. Any now, gas in there at least? Oh, uh, uh, I don't know. I remember that. I remember the crunch, 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 crunch to get me in. That was oh, that, that was hor- that was a horrendous afternoon. Um, and then I went to Lincoln Hospital and they fixed it all with a, with a 19 like, like inch rod, K nail down the femur and four screws. And How quick was you off on your feet? Eight Cause... months it took. Um, I literally did two years of super sport, came back to BSB with Birdie. It was his first year in Superbike. Yeah. Um, there was me, Stuart Easton was on the 125 and John McGuinness on the 250 with Vimto racing. And it was great. The great little team. Paul was great. John was good crack, obviously, and Stuart Easton, nice, lovely young kid. And how old was How old would Stuart have been then? Oh well, <laughs> it was funny because yeah. he was he was officially sixteen, right? Yeah. Went up to Scotland for his birthday. He's got all these eighteen balloons all over oh, the place. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh. His mum busted him oh, okay, just with yeah. the balloons. So. Done him. Yeah. So that, that kind of told Birdie that he's uh, he's not as young as we all thought he was. But uh, uh, but yeah, he, I, I think he was about seventeen. Obviously, I was yeah. nineteen. And um, and McGuinness was about forty five, I think. <laughs> that is, yeah, that, yeah, he's been forty five forever. Yeah, no, that is. Um, oh, mate, it's mad, isn't it? When you look back through the years, though, like coming back to BSB, how was that? Like, how was that for you? Like, it was a bit of a baptism because, like, I'd, I'd 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 only done really one year on a proper six hundred. So, so you went to the, so you done the World Superbikes, the World Super Sport, and then you injured yourself at Cad. How, what was you at Cadwell then? Uh, no, that was with BSB. Oh, that was, okay. I so was that already was, riding. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we'd then... done, we'd done about, I think we'd done about three or four rounds, and then we got a test, and I crashed at the test, and, and that was it. It wiped me off the whole year. But I, the last race I did for BSB was at Alton Park, and I, and I beat Nile McKenzie on the INS Ducati when he was Hodgson's team. Hodgson won that year. Yeah, okay, yeah. Walker broke down at Donington. I, yeah, I do remember and, and that. that because I remember Walker was very upset, weren't he? Yeah, yeah. And Didn't that, he cry? And the fans yeah, went absolutely nuts for him. Yeah, yeah, it was awful for him. Awful. Because uh, it was obviously going out to the last race, so um, but it was Neil Hodgson one and now McKenzie was his teammate that year, and I finished fifth I think at Alton and I beat McKenzie on the on the Ducati and it it was a ride I really really that's one of my best rides I've ever had in, in my career and because of that that was just before the test and that more or less put my signature on being Neil Hodgson's teammate in World Superbike in you know, one still even with I, I, I did I signed with the crutches kind of thing with with uh, with Colin Wright the team manager so I was really fortunate that I just did that result to show a 19 year old kid battling with a three time British super champion it. you know because obviously Mackenzie was a, a le- well, he was a legend but at that time he was he was still very much the man and uh, not his sons not <laughs> and how was that for you though like to be like knowing I'm going to world superbikes but I've got a broken leg because like the mental side of recovering from a broken femur, like the the mental side for you, like all of a sudden you're on the sofa for however long you, yeah. you can't rehab until a certain time. You, you have a certain like program to get back. Like how was that for you? Like the mental side is something that yeah, is tough. so for every professional racer, like you go through peaks and troughs, you go from winning to, like you said, being down in the dumps, yeah. to winning, to partying, to being, it's yeah. incredible, and, isn't it? Uh, biggest problem with that one, I didn't walk properly for ages and I thought, crikey, like, um, as long as I can ride, I'm fine. But I don't want to be spannered, um, like walking like this for the rest of my life already. At um, did you have a funny limp? Yeah, for ages. Yeah, and yeah. And, and even now, like fifty cent. <laughs> not cool. well. <laughs> depends where I'm walking. <laughs> <laughs> but even now, like I've, I've done a, f- uh, a few marathons with the running, and like that right right um, glute. Um, once it hits, it hits that wall. You know, when you're doing your training and you hit a wall with your legs, just with leg power when you're cycling and stuff. Um, that right leg literally. Half an hour before my left um, goes completely, and I'm dragging, I'm dragging it That's around. Incredible. Yeah. So the muscle damage, obviously, with the the impact, still uh, that is for life. You know, we were talking about Marquez's shoulder and, st- and arm, oh. and um, you you can recover from an injury and the broken bones mend, but the muscle damage, there's something that you just lose the endurance um, uh, strength 
in in a particular limb, whatever it is. If you really do knacker it up, um, you can get you can go in the gym and lift exactly what you were lifting before with it after a few weeks and months. But if you try and do 30 of them like you used to, you'll see it fall off a cliff really quickly. And that's the one of the biggest problems of getting serious injury. So you think that Marquez might end up in like in his older years of racing, he might just lose that little bit. Because let's face it, your arms obviously are a massive part of counter steering. Yeah. Obviously, you pull a hell of a lot on the bars. I don't know if yeah. if you don't race motorbikes, you wouldn't know. But when you're riding, you actually are pulling the opposite way very hard. Yep. I've actually pulled bars in before in, yeah. on the opposite side. I, I, I think... Um, Whilst Marquez is training as much as he has and, and focusing um, on that area when he's trying to get the balance back between both arms to get the, yeah. the symmetry there, um, I think what he'll find is when he does stop training when he's retired, that arm will lose its, its endurance quicker. strength much quicker. Um, that's You'll what have I'm, arms like me then, look. look at these all. <laughs> stop looking at them as well. I can see you looking at them. Can't see them these are here. strong for long, mate, all right? <laughs> <laughs> these are... Yeah, but it's um, and then like so yeah, like what what did winning mean to you? Like what? How did that sort of go? Like did because some people were like, for me, winning that's it. it. There was no first, like second or third didn't really matter to me. I'm like podium, that's good for the championship. I'm happy with that. Uh, but friends of mine and people obviously close, like no, it's winning or not. Like Carl Foggy said on the podcast previously, like if I weren't winning, that was it. Like was that oh, yeah. the same? Was oh, you that level of competitiveness? Absolutely. And I, and I don't think you can achieve these level of, of, of achievements without that, without having that mentality towards it and that approach towards it. But it's not an easy existence. You know, it's, if you want to be a professional sportsman, it's like a, a pyramid where you kind of, you do your super teens and your super stock and you finish 10th and then 8th and then 6th and you're on the way back home in the car with your first podium trophy. And, and, and it's all positive and you're always tr going in the direction that you want to get. And then you get to the top when you win a race, that's still climbing up the pyramid. You don't realise it, but you're still just climbing up. But when you're champion, that's it. You're at the top. And all of a sudden, all the rest of the area that was enjoyable before just doesn't exist. ever exist anymore. And you either, and that's why it's tough at the top, because there's only the top that's ever satisfying. And it's a, it's a, it's a lonely old place because... Um, you, you realise as, as a competitor, once you actually are a world champion or a British Superbike champion, it doesn't matter what you win. Once you win, it's it's you realise just how unsatisfying it is after like one week to then going, oh crikey, it wasn't it wasn't everything I was uh, um, uh, trying to strive of 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 just honing in and focusing on in my life of what I thought that it was going to give me as far as some kind of like. Um, Fulfillment, fulfillment. Or that sort of, yeah. yeah. I guess it's like people chasing the money. Oh, yeah. I want that million pound. I want that million pound. They get it and they're like, oh, next. Now I want two million. The yeah, next. it's like that. Un yeah, and yeah. it's relentless. And if you want to get on the treadmill of like of that way of like living, you know, it is great and it, it it's a fast old life and it's a, an exciting life. But um, but don't expect to 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 find um, uh, yeah, don't don't expect to find kind of that that satisfaction that satisfaction from it. Well, we were talking, weren't we? I mean, like the price you've had to pay to be two-time world champion. Like your wrist, we're sat here now, and your wrist doesn't move. And that is, we were saying, you can have a satisfied career and ride around in fifths and sixths. And okay, it was fine. Yep, could have probably done better, but you've accomplished what you've accomplished, and it hasn't. It's come with its price, hasn't it? And yeah, we were just saying actually, like about how many riders careers have, have ended due to injury and it's when you actually I've never actually sat and said it out loud until we spoke earlier about it and it's quite a lot I think like there's a lot more than we named yep. initially and the price of winning comes it comes it's like it comes at a price doesn't it yeah and unfortunately we're the people sat on the motorbikes the motorbikes get fixed up and can go again yeah we always can't can we no but having something that you wake up for and you've got an opportunity to be the best and be the best you can be as well it's just a privilege. That's because you said, when you wake yeah. up, when you wake up in life with nothing much going on, um, it's it can be a it can be a bleak old, um, uh, you know, um, it, like existence. It, it like is just not yeah, not satisfying. And that's yeah. the thing because from whatever age you started racing to when you retired from racing, the motivation is the same. Like you want the same goal. You have the same motivation. You have the same drive. You have. I'm going to do this, this, this today to become better at this. And that is for how if say you have a 20 year, 20 year long career. That's what that is, isn't it? And yeah. it's like when that stops, yeah. Like Gary Mason actually said to me recently, he said, mate, enjoy it when it's good. Enjoy it when it's bad. Cause one day you won't be doing it. 
And trust me, you'll miss the bad days as well. Yeah. And that's something I've kind of learned to be like, all right, I'm having a bad day. I I'm know I'm experienced enough to make it better again. It's going to come better. Um, relax, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it, but you can tell yourself all that you want to, but um, without that intensity to you, your approach to it and that that That's changed be, now being unsatisfied by it, yeah, yeah, you don't, you don't, you're not going to achieve what 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 you want to. But one of the things as well is 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 realizing just how many people are around you helping you actually put it together and and and, and achieve the things that you would like to. You know, everybody from the the, the guy that drives the truck t to the track. You know the the people that set up the hospitality and uh, and the chef that makes the food over the weekend, and um, to the engineers working on your bike, to the team manager putting everything together, and huge. It's and you know the tire engineer, the the, the suspension engineer. There's uh, uh, and uh, and they're all there, not just for you, but they all they're all there to succeed as well. I mean it's a it's. I mean I used to Frankie Carcetti, for example he he was an electronics engineer in the GSE racing when I first did world superbikes with Neil Hodson and then to see him at, sat at the side of Juan Mir in 2020 I think when he won the championship yeah. to be a world MotoGP champion uh, chief engineer it's it's special and sometimes that's forgotten a little bit there is everybody in that team including the chef and the truck driver right that feed off success and they're all making sacrifices to be there. Yeah. Whether it's from their family, whether it's from their home, from their home country, from whatever it may be. Yeah. They all want to be there, don't they? And that's that's actually something that I like. I would say is one of like my personal strengths is that I don't like I try and keep the team g'd up. You know, was that something you was good at? Was you like or like winners a team, losers a team type yeah. thing? Yeah. I was, yeah. There's a certain, each team's different. Obviously, at world championship level, they might be multilingual. So it's more difficult to kind of like have that interaction and banter to keep a mood when you can't speak the language. But How many languages can you speak? Oh, well. well obviously you've got Donny. Donny. English. Yorkshire. <laughs> South Yorkshire. Yeah. Uh, and, and obviously a little bit of Italian, uh, but, yeah. uh, but very, very little. I've, but I learned a bit of the Italian with five years with being Bicicati because one, two, three, four... Uh, we're um, we're all uh, with uh, with Ducati indirectly with GSC Racing HM Plant uh, for for three years and then two years with the factory team. So, but with, I noticed with GSC Racing with the British team, British banter, uh, uh, even the evenings and the hotels and all the rest of it, it's um, it's 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 so it's so much more engaging and and fun and 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 also you can you can manipulate a, a vibe in a garage when you speak the language. When I walked into the factory Ducati garage and everybody spoke Italian and I spoke next to nothing, um, I, I realized that it was just my results and my feedback to my engineer and my results on the track that were going to help generate the vibe. But when you're in a factory Ducati team in MotoGP or in World Superbikes, right? if you're not winning, then it's then it's your, you're you the problem. Yeah. yeah. And it, oh, it's, 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 it is huge pressure being you know, in, in, in a team that's, uh, that's won multiple championships before with multiple riders. Um, without speaking the language to them, it's like, well, I'll get my leathers on, I'll win, and you know, hopefully that'll cheer them up a bit. <laughs> but that, yeah, but that Italian side happy. of things, I'm watching the Drive to Survive documentary at the minute. I don't know if you've seen it, and the Italian, the Ferrari guys, gosh, like, like signs would they're be like easily third, and they're not, and they're like, sh like, like, it's like bloody hell, no, guys. Not easily like, pleased. But that is what was what was it like that when you first got your factory seat? Like, do you remember going into the garage and seeing your bike? Because, mate, you factory bike, like the factory parts, the factory everything. Like, yeah. was you just like, wow? Well, I was I was a little bit lucky, really, because it was I I have Pirelli tires to thank for a factory Ducati ride. Because in two thousand and one, two three, I was with GSC, and in two thousand and four, GSC Racing with Ducati were going to be the factory Honda. Fireblade team with HM Plant in World Superbike with Michelin's. And then the World Superbike Championship, right last minute, did a deal where it was going to be a one tire roll, Pirelli's all around. Honda pulled out. I had, I had, well, I was signed with GSC Racing. And fortunately for me, Daryl Healy, Colin Wright, and, and, and uh, John Jones, and everybody in the team, they let me go because all of a sudden there was a ride in the factory Ducati team because they were sticking with the championship with Pirelli's. But Honda, with the relationship they had with Michelin, pulled out. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So I had a factory Ducati ride just because Honda pulled out. Wow. And then, so when that all was unfolding in the off-season, would it have been mid-season? 
Um, no, this honestly, it was like September of 2003. So you'd have been, so you'd have still been racing wherever you would have been racing. It's World Superbike yeah. with Neil Hodgson, uh, with Chris Walker yeah. in 2003. Finished the third behind Hodgson won that year with the Zaus. And um, yeah, and that luckily. Was loose. Well, uh, luckily they went to four strokes in GP in three and four, right? Yeah. Um, and they wanted all the superbike riders because of the four stroke experience. So they took oh, Edwards, yeah. Bayliss. Hodgson, Zaus. Oh, some names. Well, so yeah. luckily they had a big clear out and I was then the next one. Ooh, I, yeah. I won the championship. Yeah. <laughs> and then what about, so what about the, um, like the experience? Like, yeah, like going in, like just seeing the bike, like, cause that's what sometimes like, yeah, I don't know. Like for me, like when you see that all the, like the blingy bits on the bike and just I'm on a factory, but do you remember like the first time you got to ride it and being like, holy shit, this is fast or no, holy shit. The first time <laughs> I rode a factory Ducati, this it is... was a 999 on Pirelli, intermediates or wets at Valencia Ooh. in February or something like that. So oh, it's cold. January. Oh my God. And it was weaving down the straight oh. because the Pirelli tyres back then, the, the wet tyres especially, good Lord. And they had the famous Ducati weave, didn't they? Genuinely. Yeah. Remember, like, remember yeah. you used, oh, it was yeah. always, weren't it? That, I, I literally, yeah. I went out of the pits and you can imagine like, so I walk in the garage, oh, I've got all so those things that you're like yeah, imagining. Like, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got my little, 52 on the back of the oh, seat, the all brakes, nicely embroidered. The, just everything. Everything's new. <laughs> you know, nothing's <laughs> been scratched yet. Yeah. Even the leathers. And then I went down pit lane in my red leathers and all with my factory stuff. Went out of pit lane, <laughs> ran the first couple of corners at Valencia. It's like a bit of a go kart track, isn't it? Ran the airpin, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, right, you've got to be fast past the pits as a factory Ducati rider. So I come out there. Even on wets, it was a damp track. I thought, right, I'll, I'll open it up. Honestly, I nearly high sided where the pit, pit boards were. Imagine if you did that. <laughs> It's so embarrassing, wouldn't it? Probably lost oh, my job there. And then. The bike, the bike was it's a problem. <laughs> and then obviously to trump that, yeah. MotoGP. Like, yeah. do you remember like getting the call from management? Did you have a manager that dealt yeah. with that? And, Roger Burnett. Yeah. Yeah. And what did what did Roger call you up and say? Look, we might be having a little sniff here at some GP action. Yeah, I had a bit of a sniff in 2004 when I won because I was only 23 and there was a bit of a possibility uh, with Pramac back in the day. Um, but um, but it was not the package to be on at all back then, and they were really uncompetitive. Un 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 so we, we decided to stay in Superbike for a couple of years and, and do did what we did. And then obviously in 07 when I was, uh, i tell you why I got a GP call was there was a particular wildcard rider at Valencia called Troy Bayliss in 06 when Nicky Hayden won. Yeah. And Troy Bayliss turned up that weekend as a wildcard and won. I was going to say, I, I knew, yeah, I was going to say that. I remember watching that race actually. And I was pushing him around and beating him on a few occasions in 06 in Superbike. So luckily what Troy Bayliss did that weekend gave a bit of a reference what superbikes were capable of, of, you know? So that was a, an amazing advert. Like, if any champion goes up, like, from the 600s to superbike or superbike to MotoGP, if that rider can do really, really well, it gives everybody else a bit of a shot who's been battling with them as a bit of a showcase. So That's what he was like with Scott Redding when he went from yeah. BSB to Worlds. So yeah. He's like, look, this BSB, is the level. Yeah, BSB can mix it. Yeah. <laughs> like, we yeah. just need the opportunity. Yeah. Like, Yeah. No, definitely. I, I, and... Unfortunately, at the minute, with uh, obviously Taz McKenzie, the, the Honda 600 not being that competitive, that's not a great showcase for him. But you know mm. they're going to get the parts in Aston, so fingers crossed he will. He it's showed what, it, hopefully. Well, he showed what he showed <laughs> what talent he was in the yeah. wet. You know, amazing ride in, in, in the wet, and obviously John McPhee as well on, on the podium. Um, and and then obviously uh, Brad Ray, he's not doing the, the long haul races, just the European yeah. races. But it's so so important that Brad Ray does well for you guys. Yeah. Really, really important because yeah. anybody that wants a shot at world superbike levels, that, that that's the benchmark. It is. Yeah, if the champion's going, the champion's got to do well and showcase the national championship as best as he can. It doesn't matter if I sit here and go, oh, if I had that opportunity, I'd be much faster. It doesn't matter because if the people around you don't go and do it, yep. then obviously it makes you look bad, doesn't it? Yeah, of course it does. Well, but, we saw how tough it was mm. last year with uh, Taz, obviously, on, on the McKenzie Yamaha, just rocking up on the Thursday and trying having a go at it of, of the weekend with no testing on that bike. I mean, I, I, I said something and it, it stirred up a bit of... Uh, Bit of control controversy with it, but um, um, but I know how difficult it is to. I don't um, believe that you saying anything on your I know, sport causing I know, aggro. I know. We're going to come to that. Though, yeah. Okay. I don't want to jump the gun right now. G Motor GP. So first, what was that experience like? Like just getting on a Motor GP bike, like. Even just sitting on it in the garage with two bikes. Well, you probably had two bikes before Superbike anyway, didn't you? Well, I was I was a bit disappointed with it at first because it was a 1,000cc Superbike and then I went on to 800s in, in MotoGP and it, it sounded good because of the exhaust system, but it was a bit 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 wet mid-range mid because the 800 didn't have much torque, but it was great. I mean, I what mean, it breaks uh, like? We spoke oh, about this I before. mean, at 200 miles an hour, you're 20 <laughs> metres later. And it, when you go to like places like Sepang, that last corner, meters. and like you... And, like, you 
uh, for what's it from 2001 to 2007 so you know you've got six years of braking at a certain point at 200 miles an hour and, and it, you're traveling aren't you at 200 mm. you know you can feel the wind on you that you're gonna you, you need to know what you're doing to slow down and then when, <laughs> when, when you jump on a motor gp bike and it's 20 meters later than that that you've kind of honed your brain and like all, all of those sensors that you've been honing all those years you need to you need to raise that bar and that's why the motor gp riders are a bit of cut above the rest because they have to be the technology on those prototype motor gp bikes require the rider to ride better to ride that equipment to its limits one of my questions for you actually was i let's say you watch like that I, I watch lorenzo do you know when he used to get out front and he never missed an apex you used to think oh yes because he's riding that bike on them tires it's not is it like they are riding that that consistently oh, unbelievable i watched uh, their data frankie actually showed me some data um before and it was the the brake markers of uh yeah like of different riders oh mate i was so impressed the front brake rear brake the, the the comparison each corner it was like the rear brake went the front brake went and it was the same distance every corner and i was like no one's that's not an automatic thing that like he's doing that the bike's not doing that like they are machines aren't they and do you think it's because they ride so much as well as like the testing the do you think that helps with the consistency yeah yeah but also honing your skills on prototype bikes it because of the capabilities of the bike are so much higher than prototype bikes you have got to hone your skills on pushing those little bikes to to their limits and and everything that that requires you don't realize that all those years when you're growing up as kids and all the experience that you, that you need they've been doing it but a higher level just because the bikes require it yeah and then by the time they got into motor gp and you know yeah, look at the 300 class. There's a reason the Supersport 300 class, there's 20 guys still on the last lap battling for the lead because there's a certain level of horsepower that requires a certain level of skill to ride them at their maximum. Yeah. And 20 riders at that age can do it, but you can't do it at MotoGP if you've not honed those, like, those, that, that, how precise you need to be and, and, and the body positioning and, um, and the skill level and, and just even the speed of thought. The, the one thing that, you know, what's the difference between MotoGP riders and superbike riders or, or the people that aren't as successful? The, the, the closest I can be is, you know, when your computer just takes a bit more time to buffer than others. You know, that's it. You've got that's... Valentino and Mark Marquez, you know, with, uh, with you know, you've got fiber connected straight into the house. Yeah. And the rest of us, you know, we're, 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 we're just watching that thing around it. Going. <laughs> Still on dollar. But yeah. that's what, that's what um, Jake said, like with the experience thing. He said, like, the people that are in Moto2 now, He's making the mistakes that he should be making in Moto Three, but because he didn't go in Moto Three, he's making them now in Moto Two, or was making them, and that's where he's he's at. So he's like, now obviously he feels ready to go, but like yeah, like the that experience thing is is. But it is funny you watch the Moto GP, you're like, oh yeah, they don't crash, they've got loads of technology. Ah, oh, yeah, they can just do them lap times because. But it is incredible, like, and it's like a newfound level of respect to watch how like Bangai when he's in the zone, Fabio when he's in the zone. It's just amazing. And their race is like 40 minutes and they 45 minutes. Yep. And well, you know how to ride a motorcycle just as good as Mark Marquez and Valentino, Danny, right? But yeah. All it is is experience and practice on the actual machine itself and the tracks that you're racing on mm. itself. Honestly, there's not much difference between that. There's there's, there's obviously the, your mental capability of, 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 like I say, kind of... Uh, um, being able to process that information a certain way to put it into place, into practice. Because to, uh, at the speed of thought at 220 miles an hour on a MotoGP bike, uh, again, there's not too many people that, that can do that calmly. Yeah. And that was valid, especially Lorenzo. You look at Lorenzo's consistency, and the consistency comes with calmness. Sick. Calmness comes with experience. Experience comes with track knowledge, tyre knowledge. That There's two main th reason there's two main things like uh, components that you need to be competitive at world level at very very top and it's tire knowledge track knowledge those two doesn't matter what bike they're on you can chuck the tires on any bike but you know the absolute limit of the front tire and the rear tire on on the actual tire uh, manufacturer and knowing the race tracks, and I mean knowing the race tracks so you don't even have to think about where that bump is in turn one you know, turn three yeah. you know um, like if you know Magello like you know Cadwell or Knockhill, right, and you know the tyres, you can be within a second and a half of anybody 
and and they are the two main 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 features and and and, and the things that you need to to put into place. I'm just going to write that down in my notes, and maybe I'll be <laughs> well, motor rider. Yeah, it's easy, isn't it? I can count. To, I can do two. It is though, honestly. Yeah. You know, when you strip it down, it is easy. And I think sometimes us motorbike racers are guilty of overcomplicating yep. things. Hundred percent. Yeah. Isn't it? Like, there's so many things that, like, we, everyone jokes about the excuse book, don't they? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll write that out today. One major thing that I was told, a bit too late in my career, to be honest, but um, someone came up to me and everything was going wrong at that particular weekend, blah, 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 blah. It said, right, I just, I just want you to write down all the things that are wrong. And there was a good dozen kind of thing that day. He said, I said, then I want you to just tell me how many of those things you can do anything about. And it's amazing how many there's not. Uh, there's not. There's not many that you can do anything about of those. And then just concentrate on the ones that you can do something about. And if you do that, it's um, it, it, it focuses your weekend dramatically. You have to cut that out. I don't want anyone hearing that. <laughs> That's funny you say that. I actually uh, Andrew Pitt come uh, to BSB and was my crew chief for a little while. Helped me out with my diet and a few other things, my training and stuff. And uh, I come in from the track one day. And he was like, well, well, DB, how's that? I said, it was shit. The, everything was shit. I'm riding like an idiot. He was like, he looked at his, down his, his paper and he went, there's no box on here for that, mate. <laughs> like that. And you know, he just had that ability to calm me down when I was younger. But the experience thing's in, impressive. But like yeah. you said, like to go to these different tracks week in, week out, to be competitive, to string all that together. It's not like you had an easy, um, easy second and third place riders. You had You had people that were... Yeah, hunting you down. It was savage, weren't it? Like it's a savage year that you was competing, and to do that and to beat them, even if you can't beat him every weekend, to beat him in the championship, like that is an amazing achievement. And yeah, um, you've got a couple of tracks. Got a trophy in Knock Hill. I, I saw, I saw the uh, um, the, the Caddle Park and, got and right the brands. brands now as well. Right. So you know the feeling now when you drive through the gates of Brands Hatch, Knock Hill, or uh, or Caddle Park. There's a certain feeling. You get it. You know it. It's the aura, isn't it? It's everything. Before you get out the mm. car, yeah. you're in the game. Yeah. And and you can't buy that. And it's having that everywhere. Is that what you were everywhere. saying with the world championship? You knew. Every gate you go in, you've, you've got to go, I'm going to be difficult to beat this weekend. This is me, yeah. This and, is me. And it, yeah, that... To get that feeling, it's unbelievable how many things need to, to fall into place from track knowledge, tyre knowledge, bike knowledge, a good team, a competitive bike... Just not being ill. What about your persona? Did you was you a was you a bit of a bastard? Like was you like right? I'm like when you. What I mean by that is like, was you like right? I'm here to win, and that's it. I'm I'm winning this weekend. That's it. Like I'm the best, because you have to have that certain level of arrogance to be a champion, don't you? And to be a world champion, that but, confidence. Yeah. But um, did you have? But that? some like, some people have an arrogance that they portray to others, but some people just have an arrogance with the self. And, and I was just really arrogant with myself on um, it. Uh, th there's no other option. And that's I'm, it. Yeah. I'm figuring this out. And this is my only focus in life. And nothing else matters. Completely nothing else matters other than succeeding at this, at this weekend mm. um, for, for, for winning, for winning this particular race. But, um, but it, it wasn't an uncomfortable existence within. And you got then people like Valentino Rossi that, was able to then on the outside, on 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 the fascia of it, uh, just be a, a, a warm, empathetic, um, open, inclusive kind of character, which was warming to other people that watched him on television. That's why he got so much support. And I noticed that. And I wasn't comfortable with who I knew and thought I was inside to be a champion because it's not likable. You know, no. you look at Mark Marquez, um, you know, being being eight time world champion or a nine time champion with Valentino Rossi, you, Mark Marquez hasn't really found a, a, a balance that Valentino did to hiding it, to hiding that bastard. Mm. Because to be a champion, we've all got that in yeah. us, and to be a bastard to yourself and to 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 very few others on the outside is is the trick to, um, to maybe having a few friends at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, but or not. Yeah. <laughs> You'd rather have two world championships or some friends. I can make friends after I've won the world championships. Yeah, but but can but can you? Because <laughs> you know, hard. are you going to be for a bastard forever with, with with that, or are you going to be able to? If you can hold down friendships around you whilst doing it, then you've got the you've got the the, the, the nice sweet balance between uh, between yourself, the racer, and and Danny. Yeah, because being the racer and 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 the competitive racer and, and the winner. Um, I don't think he's healthy for anybody. No, I think that's where having the family sort of helped me, you know, because it's like, wow, I've got a lot of, to live for outside of racing. 
But when I go racing, it's like that's 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 my thing, you know. Yeah. That's what I do, and that's quite a, quite a good. Um, you can quite you a can good go contrast, yeah. Like I'm a dad, like I'm going to be the best dad I can be. But then when I go racing, I'm a racer, yeah. And that's it. And there's uh, and that, yeah, and that's it. And that's my way, really. Yeah, I, yeah, I was yeah. never a father while I was doing it, and that's an interesting kind of concept as well on on what you do it for and and what you think your kids are going to kind of think of of it. And I had nephews when I was growing up, and that was special to see them at the track, and they were, they was on the podium with me when I was when in when they were kids and stuff, and it was lovely to to see that they could see what you're doing, which was because no matter inspiring. well no matter what it's the coolest thing isn't it yeah well like if there's not a person on the planet that i don't bump into so oh, you you did you used to do i used to race motorcycles eh, what yeah like everybody's like thinks it's what, cool. scramblers <laughs> don't dare call it a scrambler <laughs> but it's cool isn't yeah it? it is to to your gran to a six-year-old kid on the on the skate park like it's, it's cool what i said joke. to my missus when i first met her a motorbike racer she went what is that your hobby i said no it's my job and then she was like oh yeah, well, I didn't really get it at all. I was like, "Shit, I played that card far too early." She's, she's going to be well. She's going to be well not keen. Now. She married you, but you can't. Well, she's married me now. Yeah. <laughs> right. So moving on from this year, I've got a little section of the podcast, and we haven't got a fancy name for it yet. We're going to get one very soon. But it is a track review, and it's just you can say whatever you want. Favorite track? It might have been you. I like the toilet there. I like the party there. You know what I mean? Any track. So first of all, what is your favorite track? Phillip Island. But Brands Hatch close just because of the memory I have. But I am so jealous I haven't ridden Philip Island yet because oh, there's so many people that say it is amazing. It's just it's just fast. Just and the way it flows. Ah, uh, fast and flowing and 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 if 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 you want to scratch that itch of being a bastard or um, wanting that um, whatever syndrome you've got to be wiped out, you just go down the start and finish straight at Philip Island and straight into Dewan's Corner in fourth gear. Is that it? Back to in. Yeah. Just, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. You only have to do it once, and you can you, you're set for a month. You yeah. can you can be a normal living social kind of fella for, After for that. at least a month. At just, least a just month. by going around doing. So if months. I'm starting to be a proper dickhead around the house, just Steph, get, send me off to Philip Island. Philip Island. Two or three laps will do it. Bit of oil on the brakes as well. Proper Honestly, shit me up. You'll be coming and doing the, the washing up and the over and everything. Just after two. Don't laps. say that. She'll have me flight booked next week. Um, and what's your most memorable moment at Philip Island? Beating Bayliss in 07 in the second race. And that, that, to beat Troy I've not Bayliss, seen that race. I'm going to watch it on the train. Uh, home. To beat Troy Bayliss around there um, was was up there with uh, with the greatest ever achievement. And uh, it's uh, I, because you have to look after the tyres. How did the you, race unfold? Yeah, well, I, where I, was you starting? I was two or three tenths quicker than him all weekend long. And there was two races just on a Sunday back then. First race, I thought, right, Troy, keep up with this. And I flat (laughs) out from the beginning, proper, proper (laughs) amateur, proper schoolboy era. And I was at the last two corners, like, raw, smoking, like, yeah, keep up with this. Yeah. Four laps to go. I'd got no no rear tire left. He come past on his duke and cleared off and won by a couple of seconds. Oh, oh, embarrassing. Ah, and then the second race, we did half the race uh, a second a lap slower. Wow. bumbling around looking behind each other and blah 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 hard and to stay switched on in that situation isn't it yeah to be like, to go slower. i know what i'm doing yeah, yeah but to go slower yeah and there was about eight of us in the leading pack yeah, exactly. and the commentators were thinking this is the greatest race ever yeah. but they didn't realize me with troy were just trying to save Literally, the tire. yeah um and then the last i think there was like four or five laps to go on my pit board and i went like i i, I just went and you knew that because you like, gauged it from that rate like, yeah from... but but i didn't know even if that was too early yeah and then on the last lap, it was still in there. Coming out of Siberia, there's a corner called Siberia, which is just after Miller's. Yeah. If you come out of Siberia and it hook, hook, hooks up for you. You know you've got it. Whether you're doing a qualifying lap or FP1, if you come out of Siberia and it hooks up and you go through Hayshed flat stick, like, you go, uh, and then I knew, I knew I'd got it then. So, And you can hear the Ducati at uh, Miller, you know, the twin back then. You, oh. could, you could hear him right behind you. So, um, but yeah, Philip Island race two. Um, Amazing. But I, I had a huge battle with Valentino as well at Australia in, in 08. And I passed Valentino into Doans down the front straight. Um, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. Yeah. Through. <laughs> ah, that was that was probably one of my best overtakes uh, on Valley. But um, how uh, many people can say that? There's not many people that can no, say that. No, it was, that it is was special. That yeah. is yeah, special. It's you know, write special. that note down, mate. Keeping your bedside drawer. That's something. Yeah, there's not many people can say that. Yeah, racing that, him and beating him and even well, passing him. There's yeah, not competing many with him and racing on and overtaking and, and having a bit of a just just you know just seeing like just seeing. A specialist, like you were saying about when you see that the um, Jake Dixon saying he, he, he's learning now what he should have done years ago on these prototype bikes. When you get behind a specialist like Valentino Rossi on a MotoGP bike on these tracks that he's raced at since he was like 16, 
and he doesn't put a foot wrong anywhere. And if you're thinking about overtaking him, you know that you're going to need a fresh pair of underpants. Just even thinking about it, never mind having a go at it. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure and an honour to follow someone that does something so well. Well, I know this is the track for you, and we are. But I've got to ask you this: I know that racing. When I raced Shaky Burn, I first come into BSB in 15, and I passed Shaky up into the chicane at Fruxton, and I was like, "Have that, mate. Go on." Literally passed me back. And I thought, that's right, I'm going to do the same move on you again. But I couldn't. He'd moved over. He'd, he'd protected his line. He adapted to my overtake, kind of slotted it in his knowledge book and was like, right, he ain't coming back past me there. And I was like, shit, like, how's he done that? Like, couldn't believe that he'd adapted himself like that. And I couldn't get past him. And he went to the front and I think he might have won the race. What was that like, like when you're racing the best in the world? Like, not, not the World Superbikes, like the GP boys. Like, how their race craft, like Rossi, like, what was that even like? It was tyre experience. Because um, I was really fast on the first two, two, two or three laps because the Pirelli tyres, when you go out of the pit lane, you can pin it on the lap one and go as fast as you want to on the front of the rear. It doesn't matter. They, they get to temperature and they stay to temperature. On the, on the uh, Michelins, like I was overtaking like Lorenzo at Qatar around the outside of him into turn three. Like, like, but I didn't realise how risky I was, uh, how much risk I was taking. Um, I realised a few races when I was hitting the bloody, you know, moon a couple of times. Um, but, like, uh, they, they were doing certain things towards the beginning of a race, saving that rear tyre and then riding a certain way on Michelin tyres to get the best out of them at the end and stuff like that that I had no idea on because I'd never raced um, on Michelin slicks or, or most of all my career. So that was the eye-opener. And I remember when Biaggi first came to Superbike, on the first couple of laps... You went around the outside of Biaggi. And I'm thinking, what is he doing? He Rookie, like the pressure. Yeah, yeah, what honestly, doing? Yeah. like proper, like like in the middle of the seat. And then you realise, I didn't realise so much what his problems were. I thought he was just a steady starter. I thought, oh, he just, he just looks after yeah. him. This is his tactic. No, he didn't understand on the Pirelli tie, you could absolutely pin it. If you did those things on Michelin's that he'd grown up on, honestly, you, 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 on your ass. you'd be in the audience. Yeah. Every time. Did you yeah. do that on Michelin's? Did yeah. you? Yeah. Oh, God, a couple of times. <laughs> and Lorenzo did. And and uh, a few of the newcomers did. Davizioso did. Like, you know, you went around a couple of right-handers and got the temperature in. But if you're on a clockwise track, oh, my God, you had to be careful when you went left or, you know, yeah. whatever. Um, because the temperature dropped on the side you weren't using. Like but Pirelli's don't do that. Yeah. yeah. Pirelli's don't do that. They like, just keep the, keep the heat. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Whether you're using them or not. And I don't know... Kind of like, you know, the technology. That is incredible. And then what, um, where did the love for music, so obviously, well, the love for music come from when you was very young? Yeah, grand played. My and grand was a great where did you player. discover you could sing? Like, was you in the shower oh, one God. day, letting no. it go and just like, you know what, mate, no. I am good. I was in so the back I've of a, I was in the back of a van. I was playing with a covers band and I was in the back of a van um, with with the band and uh, what so oh switch out of mine come on and so we were a bit we were a bit pissed and and I was in a bit of a play and the band well oh, Christ I think we you know we could have a go at that I can actually. imagine we're just stopping and being like no and it wasn't that good letting it go yeah mate. it wasn't that good but he was kind of like oh because yeah. I was just playing the keys at that point and a bit of backing vocals and then obviously I, you know you all have a bit of a play at some point and so that's when I started kind of having, having a bit of a sing yeah and then that's when you was like obviously once once your racing career come to an end. Is that when you started? Because or yeah. was it during your? Well, I was only twenty nine, you know. Yeah, and like that's that's I, how old I am now. That's I wasn't mad. ready that to is... stop, you know. If you feel how that's old when you, you are, retired from racing, twenty nine, and I wasn't ready for stop, and it was a real shock, and it was horrible, and it was a really, really dark, really dark. Time. Was it? How was cope? How was that like whole experience? Yeah, still am, still yeah. am. You know, you, you'll forever recover when you when this amazing job that's the best job in the world stops suddenly uh, with an injury. And then all of a sudden you're just waking up without that intensity and, and incentive in your life. It's uh, it's a horrible, horrible place. And the only other thing I knew I could do, all right, was music. So I just channeled all my energy into that and did a two albums with the band and toured for eight years. And we we support some great people like Deep Purple and and, and The Darkness and, and Aerosmith at Calling Festival and and it, um, you know Status Quo when the when the Fab Four got together um, and. Uh, that, those eight years were, were really special and it, and it just helped me uh, wean off 
wean off uh, the drug that was motorcycle racing. And why was it like rock music and not like grime or dubstep or house or techno or you what? know my age. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I don't know. I reckon you could drop a few, uh, drop a few big boy bars. Yeah, we go, yeah. we go to a few streets. If I tried the that corner. in the back of the van, I want to buy the job. <laughs> yeah. No, I do. Uh, no, but it's quite funny, really, because they're such contrasting things, aren't they? Like they're not rock and roll like, and bikes. No, no, ro- no. That's actually yeah. yeah. That I mean, come on. Like yeah, that, the days that, of racing motorbikes. That's egg and chips. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, rock and you know other other genres, not but rock and roll. Bushy's beer tent, mate, at the TT. Have you ever been down there? I have. Oh, we have. You've have you played there. I've survived that a few times. Have you actually played in no. there? No. No, I, I was never brave enough for that. I mean, I went down there one TT, and I'm not a really big. I'm not a really big drinker, and I'm absolutely not built like that either, mate. Bushy's beer tent. Yeah, that was an eye note. I did get a bit smashed up actually that night. Yeah, that's mad. Did you ever fancy the roads? No, I, I lived on the island for eight years, and, and it's a lovely island. Beautiful, because it's you walk down like the town, like in Douglas, and there's like motorbikes in the window, and you're like, this doesn't happen oh, like, at home, does it? Like, a motorcycle racer living on the Isle of Man, it, I don't know, it's like, uh, um, it, it is a bikers it island. It is what it is, isn't it? Yeah, it is a bikers island, and I, I loved it. But um, never fancied Northwest mm, TT. Now, luckily, I just came along just after the Foggies, Hizzies, uh, McCallans, and uh, all of those, uh, Joey Dunlops and um, the guys that were, were really, really competitive at short track did the TT, um, obviously from the 60s of even being a part of the calendar, you know, in the 60s yeah, you went from Silverstone to the Alaman and so, and then it kind of in the 70s, 80s, 90s, kind of then just kind of weaned out. And then when I came along, you didn't need to do the TT as part of the circuit to make you a name Because you could drop around, couldn't you, at one point? Yep. Could you drop the TT if you wanted to? I don't to? know, actually. I, I'm, don't know. I don't know if I'm making that up. I might have dreamt it. But it's a specialist thing. To learn 37 miles, as good as what we've been talking about with, with this track knowledge that we've just been on about, um, you know, the John McGuinnesses, uh, uh, David Jeffries, and uh, like I say, the Hisses and the Foggies and all the rest. Just very, very brave. But if 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 this job is a drug and we are addicts, then the TT's heroin. It is. And my missus asked me the other day, she said to me, oh, I listened to your Carl Foggy podcast and you said it's probably not going to be anyone in our lifetime that does what he done with the, in terms of the winning the short circuit and the Isle of Man. She said to me, why? And I said, it's because they're so such complete discipline, different disciplines now. But do you agree that it's got harder because the bikes are so different these days, for BSB to, um, world. Yeah. Do you like, what's your take on that question? Like if my, if my wife asked you that question, what would you say? The specialist Valentino on a GP bike when I was following him, I got it. It's like, ah, that's why he's so good. That because looking at it, seeing it from just behind him and seeing what what he was doing, when you're following someone around the TT course, like Hickey, and, and you know at uh, 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 the minute and, and and people like that, um, and then you go to BSB and you try and beat yourself. It's all relative. You're specialist on the packages that you're on, and you're able to push it to the limits with the skill level that you've got. And if say Bautista came to Cadwell Park this year. You'd smoke him. Don't act as a shit. Uh, be yeah. <laughs> you'd smoke him. Yeah. And I mean you'd smoke him. So why would you smoke him? Yeah. It's not just about the Track actual knowledge. talent of, the, of yeah. the person. There's so many more components And if to I went it. to Aragon, he'd probably smoke me right now. Absolutely. Give me two rounds. Absolutely. Give me two rounds, I'll smoke him. <laughs> Easy. As well. But that's it, though. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's the only Specialist. difference. Specialist. I went to World Superbikes when I was 19 years old, and, I, and, and, I, and I'm the youngest ever world champion because of that. 23. Yeah, but but like I I wouldn't have been a twenty three year old world champion if I went in world superbikes at twenty two. Exactly, it's because you started younger. Well, and I was seventeen in supersport, learning the tracks. Yeah. So those two years in supersport, and then the then the few years with with that, it's it's. Uh, um, I I I was just very very fast at an unusually early age. I was I was beating the men in at sixteen years old in the UK. I mean, it doesn't happen much now, does it? No. You know what I mean? What was your mindset like? Well, just, I just, I don't know. I just did it. Got to beat him. Just like, did it. I, I was on a naive. good bike when they, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, of course you are. Yeah. Because you don't, definitely. you don't know how you're doing it, do you? No. And you just, and you love racing on that limit and you're just doing it. I just honestly yeah. caught my leg over a bike, ringed its neck. I was an angry little man that uh, had a lot of issues and motorcycle racing was the perfect thing to put it in and, and, and I was successful at it. So that's, yes. Yeah, that's all it was. That's impressive. Um, I've got another thing here, another little section of the pod. And it is called Quiz Time. I've not got a name for it, a legitimate name for it. That's, That's what I'm calling it right now, Quiz Time. Now, this is going to test your knowledge on many things. But I've, I've, I have to make these. I make this quiz up. Is, and this, is this pre-Watershed? <laughs> this is 
me making it up, but it's kind of like, it's really hard because I don't want to make it too easy and I don't want to make it too hard. So I have to try and find a middle ground. Yeah. So I'm going to just throw these five questions at you. You're probably going to get them because I'm confident for you. Cool. How many race wins did Ben Spees have in World Superbikes? Oh, crikey. This is good then. Oh, By the Spies. way, if you lose, you have to give me a tenner per question. So this so is all good. 2009 <laughs> on the Yamaha. Um, I think in total. In total. World yeah, Superbike two races wins. a weekend that they're still yeah, in, right? Yeah. Uh, so 20, 20, 20, uh, 12, 12 rounds, so 24 races roughly in total. Uh, he would have probably won, won, I think, half of them. So let's say he had 12 wins. 14. That ah. weren't bad. That's that's pretty... Because I didn't. I thought he won another world championship, but he only won the 2009. Um, I know it because he took my job in GP. I know, I saw up. that. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah thanks yeah. for reminding me. Yeah, sorry, mate. I won't bring his name <laughs> up anymore. Uh, how many he MotoG... 14 too many for yeah. me. <laughs> how many MotoGP 250 championships did Biaggi win? Four. Very well done. What is the fastest lap at Donington Park on a motorcycle? Oh... Long circuit, obviously. Yeah, do you know roughly the lap times? Uh, it's 27, 28s. Faster. Faster these days. Oh, I'm giving you tips now. Are you in the 26s hits. now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cry, well, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I am anyway. Well, in that case, because you're one of the top yeah. boys, I'd say uh, 26, 7, 4, 8. 20, that's very accurate, but it's 26, 2. Oh, wow. By Johnny Ray. Ah. I think that even was last Where's year. It? I'm sure I saw that last year. Was it? Um, But I do get... I use Google for these nah, questions. Nah, sorry, mate. I'd have been two about. seconds off for that. No. I'm going back here 16 years ago when I was rattling around, obviously. <laughs> You're right, mate. You'd make it look easy now. How many top 40 hits did the Eagles have? Or do they have? Wow. This is, come on, mate. Singles? I don't know. Yeah. No, just I mean, just top hits. 40, just top, I mean, top, 40 top 40 hits. hits. Come on, mate. Oh, wow. Don't get all... Well, Hotel California, uh, um, the actual... Uh, the album Top 40? Yeah, how many top oh, 40 hits? God, top 40, they must have had... 16. 18. So close, mate. Not too bad. Not too bad. bad. Final one. Who won the 2003 BSB Championship? 2003. Wow. That's like, um, that was just before Kunari Championships, I think. Um, So 2003, you are, is it uh, Monster Energy Shaky Burn? I don't know if it was the uh, Monster Mob, was it? Monster Mob. I don't know if it was Monster Mob, but it was, it did say Ducati Shaky Burn. Yep. So it's got to be the Monster Monster Mob. Mob. Mate, you smashed it. Not too bad. So I don't know. Yeah, um, I've got on my, I've got little notes and stuff. How was it retiring from racing? We've just spoke about that. Yeah, obviously. Awful. Oh, yeah, because yeah. it's the only thing you know, isn't it? From such a yeah, life, young age. life is really, really tough. To, I, I think, I think you've done the right thing having some kids. Would you have done anything different if you have could some have kids? I think and set something up maybe a way as well to see you, um, like, or just I you, had the music. Yeah. I yeah. can't, I can't complain. I mean, I can complain about getting retired ten years early. And that, it, I think it was just that 10 year period because I had to kind of like endure all of my competitors that I kind of beat and raced against and had so much fun with for another 10 years. And 29 ain't no age. Like I'm 29 yeah. now and I feel like I'm scra- just starting yeah. to scratch the surface. Well, Biagi so. was world champion at 40 and that really bugged me. I'm thinking, Christ, I could have had another 10, 11 years of, of, of having a it's mad, good crack it? with him round. 29. Mm. Like I genuinely feel like I'm literally, like you, at this point you'd already won two world championships. So yep. you're like, I know what I need to do. Yep. You needed the package. Obviously you went to the BMW at that point and it weren't, it yep. was hard work, weren't it for yep. you? And then, yeah, we just started. I don't what do, was I, the crash? What was? I did, did I did one race with with BM, Then we went testing again in Aragon, and there's a long, long left before you uh, go down the corkscrew. Yeah. Then a long, long oh, left. Yeah, there. And um, I, 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 my, uh, yeah, my talents. Uh, uh, high side. My ambitions outweighed my talents. Yeah, high side. Yeah, just landed landed on my right wrist and kind of folded inwards, really, really badly. Didn't break it, anything, but just flipped my bones. Um, and when the bones aren't all in place uh, in your wrist, uh, unfortunately, it stops all the movement. And so it's fair to say it was just a super unlucky way of... Oh, I've had like, my, much, much bigger crashes than that. I just literally twanged my wrist so badly, just so awkwardly, and my right wrist as well, that um, you know I couldn't control uh, control the throttle. I think you could have gone left left, left oh, wrist no, throttle. Can easy, can easy, you, mate. Can you imagine? <laughs> no. I, this, this Actually, people... I'm, I'm testing next week. I've not ridden a bike since October. I don't know where the throttle is anymore. <laughs> There are people that come up to me still. Why can't you just put it on the left? Why can't you? It's like, mate, you I don't. don't. Do you not realise how how, how how good we have to get to, to do what we do? Like, <laughs> how important, you know? the, yeah, yeah. how important that would be to get that. Like, 
Yeah, I, I, you know, let's. Uh, I mean, there's probably maybe o O'Sullivan mm. that can say that as good as just with the left as he is with the right mm. with his game with snooker and that. But with motorcycle racing, um, you've honed your skills on a particular skill set of of a, the throttle being on the right. And yeah, and it's no, yeah. I, of course, you could do it on the left, yeah. but you know, you're not beating Biaggi. No, yeah, you could probably ride round. Oh, you might even get like third, fourth foot Bemzy. Booker, might, yeah. maybe, but not the yeah. Bailey. <laughs> <You might, laughs> oh, yeah. I reckon you might even score a point at Bemzy. I was going to say third or fourth. I actually said that, but then you were horrible, so I thought I'd go Bemzy. Hey, darling, more at Bemzy, mate. Don't Gosh, underestimate it. Yeah. It's like I say, it's all relative. It is, it is. And the team manager side of your life, then, how was that for you? Like the Good fun. Yeah. Danny Webb. He did well, I thought. Yeah. Honestly, really, really enjoyed it. It was a bit of a kind of introduction for the team that were going from road racing into world uh, into the world paddock. And I kind of helped out with that and with Supersport. And we were, I think we were 18th on the grid in Australia in the very first race. And it was literally just as COVID kicked off that February of um, um, of 2020 because we were flying back and we were got really lucky that we actually got back because everything was shutting down. Mm. And... Um, and then at the last race in, in, in Portugal, he was fifth on the grid. And yeah. just the whole process of kind of like getting the structure, the, the mentality and the approach, what happened in the garage, the planning. The planning is so important. That every professional team knows how many laps we're doing when and what tyres and all the rest of it before this session even start, before you even open the garage. And to do that, to get that structure around Danny, he really, really like um, fed off it and did an amazing a job of not only going from pushing a certain amount that you do on road racing, because you can't push like you do it on, on no. short tracks, but you kind of, then you're exercising and uh, your, 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 your speed of the mind and processing that information at that level. And you don't realize, but you're honing it in on that level. And for him to have up that bar to pushing 100% completely sport, yeah. and risking everything on every single corner. Mm. That wasn't an easy concept for him. It took him a long time to to be able to push to that level uh, from all the road racing he'd done. So he and, really and the proud structure of things big. Like it's so, huge. like right FP one five laps to start with in yeah. blah blah blah. That having the, this that, is what you're going to do. Yeah. The, the, the least you allow the riders to think about what they're doing, the better. Yeah. Get the rider sat down. Tell them what they're doing when. Go out there and just push as much as you can and be as consistent as you can so that you'll give us the information we need to make it better. Yeah. If you go out there and you do 32-1, 32-7, 33-5, 32-4 and then come in, right, I'm not sure where, we, where we're going to be able to improve on that. Yeah, because you know? it's coming from you at the minute. Because where is, where, where is the limit? If you do 32 ones all the way through the, those five laps, we know that that's roughly the, the limit of yeah. the bike. Right? Yeah. So we need to improve on that. And the data that that comes in at, you can you can improve from that. But um, you know the fork travel and the and the rear shock travel and the speeds and the braking uh, um, uh, forces. If you if you vary within a second, it's like how do we adjust things? Yeah, you need to be in a couple of attempts. And was that something that you was quite analytical about in your own career? To be honest, again, I, I rode for Castro and Honda my first two years in World Championship and, and the team around me and the experience that they already had kind of then taught me how to approach my racing and it wasn't just about getting a helmet on and, and wringing its neck. and, and, and Relying that, on talent. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it needs to be more than that. And um, I was I was just really lucky to work with some great people early doors that uh, put me on, on the right approach to, to, to my racing early. Well, my final question for you on air, we're going to have this recorded Who's going to be World Superbike Champion? Uh, unfortunately, I think with the first race, I think Alvaro Bautista could win every single one. And are you going based off of what we've seen? He could, if he wants to, he can. He, I think that bike is capable of winning every single one. It, if if Bautista doesn't win every single race this year, I think it will be because of his own fault. Yeah, because so I think the package fresh. is that good compared yeah. to Top Racks Yaman. I think uh, I think the Kawasaki is the, uh, the, the the one that's got. The, the most issues on development. Do you know, I was looking at an interesting stat because I'll do the commentary and all the rest of it. Since 2012, BMW, and this is not a great stat for BMW, by the way. Yeah, you're not allowed to say that on here, mate. I, I know, sorry, Paul. <laughs> right? They came into World Superbikes in 11. Yeah. So since 2011 to now, um, give me the improvement rate on the race time at Phillip Island, which is not no, changed. No yeah, so it's the same amount of laps, same amount of... I need to get this out, actually. So the same amount of times, uh, similar conditions, and the track's not changed, uh, and all the runoff and I'm all the rest ten, of it. I'm going to go 10... I'm going to go... God, if it's a 38-minute race, let's say a 35-minute race, and you went 10%, that's three and a half minutes, isn't it? It's not going to be that much. Where is it? Three, 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3%. 3
And would it go three percent? No, actual time, actual um, the the actual race time, time, the end time uh, on on how much things have changed. Thirty since, seconds faster. Since, 30 seconds. That's not too bad, actually. That's that's as, that's as good as well. Because over 30 laps, that's quite a lot. Because if you had 30 laps of the track, that's a second a lap. But obviously, there's not 30 laps, is there? There's less than that. Right. So, it God, is... my maths is good. Anyone yeah. see tutoring, just let me know, yeah? <laughs> Do a little, little uh, here we, side where, hustle. Where was it? I, I got it on here somewhere. Dan's quick maths. Uh, you're going to you're gonna have to edit this. Come on, mate, we might have to... You're going to have to edit this bit. Right. <laughs> so in 2011, the race time was 34 minutes, 16 seconds. In Australia, Ducati's improved by 36 seconds since then, with what Bautista has just, just done. done. Yeah. Honda's improved by 23 seconds, which was that's my time uh, in 07. That's a pretty fair. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Kawasaki's improved by 22 seconds, and BMW's improved by seven seconds. Wow. That's an incredible stat, that, actually, isn't it? Seven seconds. So when Ducati's improving by 36 seconds in a total race in 11 years, and you're improving by seven... It, it's it's a clear indication of of how manufacturers can move forward in different speeds compared to others. And talking about that, like it's not as though they won the championship last year and they've rested on their laurels. They've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes. Like that is something the Formula One teams do, isn't it? Like they are always developing. And I think that in this day and age, like the competitiveness of the riders, we all are at the limit of what we can possibly do away from the circuit. That it matters most when you get on the bike and. Yeah, like I think if you stuck Johnny on the Ducati next weekend or this weekend, what do you, what would he do? Yeah, isn't it like yeah. you know straight away he would he would probably do what Bautista. Well, doing. if Kawasaki keep on doing what they're doing, you might you might get, you might see that. So. I quite like <laughs> to see a mix up. I love yeah. it. Do you know? Like, well, there's only two riders that have won championships on two manufacturers as well. Only me and Troy and Corsa. So yeah, I, that's and, that's and, mad, and, John, and Jonathan Ray and Top Rack. They've all got that kind of talent, and I'm sure as competitors that we've been talking about, I'm sure they'll want a, a, a new challenge. If, you know, in the yeah. future. So. Agreed. And um, who's been your best teammate? I've got to ask you that. Before we sign this off, we're yeah. not, who's been your best? Who's like your best teammate? Either whether it was your like your mate around the paddock, like um, Neil Hodgson, I think. Yeah, yeah. We had a good two years together, with, with and he taught me a lot. I was new to superbikes, and he and he was very generous in in telling me where I was going wrong, and and wanting me to improve. Genuinely wanting to improve, and rather than fair. rather than just telling you enough just to make sure he's point two in front of you. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's quite fair. That's quite fair. And who's going to win the MotoGP World Championship this year? Then that's the last question before we sign off. Uh, I would love to see Jorge Martin have a shot at it. Uh, if It'd be pretty just, cool. The fact that he lost yeah. the factory seat. Yeah. If he not just lost keep his it, composure, because mm. he's fast, but it's just the composure and experience. If he can put it all together, he's got a chance. But I think uh, another year on, isn't he as well? So I think Banya is, uh, is 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 just in that zone at the minute. He's going to be a tough, tough and man to beat. Like we spoke about the bike, the mindset, the. Yeah. I think if you put Fabio that, on the Ducati, I think you might see... And also that final piece of the jigsaw puzzle on how to win a championship. He's he'd, done it. He'd already done that with Moto2, obviously, and everything. But but to, to, win a, to win the championship and then to do it again, it's like, ah, I didn't need to crash at Saxon Ring. I could I have finished it. To, I could have, yeah. Exactly. Because he's got that, like Bautista's got now with Superbike and Prelli tyres. Yeah. It's a, tough, it's a tough package to beat once, once that rider's got that level of talent, experience and knowledge of the bike. Well, thank you so much, mate. Yeah, I mean, Pleasure. thanks for getting on. Pleasure, Obviously, uh, yeah, grew up watching your race motorbike, oh. so now getting to talk to you about it. Yeah, pleasure, pal. Good luck this season yourself. Thank you very much. Guys, thank you for listening to episode nine of Pushing the Limit podcast. Be sure to check out who our next guest is. Thank you. Thank you.